Welcome back, and I'm happy you made it for round two of Statistical Thinking for Forensic Practitioners, a CSA Fall 2022 short course sponsored by NIST. Your speaker back for round two is Hal Stern, the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor at University of California, Irvine. He is a co-director at CSA, phenomenal educator, world-renowned statistician, and my gift to you for the day. Hal, it's all yours. Thank you, Anthony, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Kristen, for working the working the desk, as it were. Uh, great to uh, have everyone uh, with us again. And I thank you very much for bearing with us this morning when we had a little bit of a link malfunction. Um, and uh, by waiting the 10 minutes, we were able to get back to uh, most of what we were expecting, probably still missing a few more people and they'll probably continue to show up. This is the second session of statistical thinking for forensic practitioners. Um, as outline of the course is as follows, or as you see on the screen, uh, last week we did part one, which is focused on probability concepts uh, that is available online if you missed it. Uh, today we'll talk about data, measurement, reliability, and also expert opinion. Uh, a couple of comments about this outline. Uh, we often have some people who've taken the short course before. Um, this is really a pretty big reworking of it. I'm actually kind of excited about it. Part one was pretty similar to what I've always done for probability, um, but parts two, three, and four are really a reworking um, to take three approaches to the way forensic evidence can be analyzed and assessed and reported. Uh, one is as expert opinion. Uh, the second is as a, using what's called a two-stage approach. And the third is the likelihood ratio. And um, in the past, I did all of those together at the end of the short course, but now I've kind of split it up. So I'll give you some tools in the first half of today's uh, presentation about data collection and reliability and validity, and then we'll apply that by looking at uh, some black box study data uh, where we see how forensic opinion as expert opinion works. And similar for the next two weeks, we'll have a mix of statistics and forensics. So I hope you enjoy that. Uh, I'll also mention, because I will forget otherwise, um, at the end of each session, you'll get an evaluation. Um, and I just want you to know how much uh, I value that. And so if you could put in comments, uh, fill that out, uh, don't put it off uh, and give us feedback. It's super helpful. In fact, the decision to go from three sessions of two hours to four sessions of two hours is based on feedback that we've gotten over the years. So with all that as precursor, uh, let's jump into today's. So the learning objectives for today's are to understand uh, how statisticians think about data collection. And in that context, we'll talk about sampling and study design. And then the second objective is focused on uh, measurement, where we'll spend some time talking about under uncertainty, uh, variability, reliability, validity. And some of these words are obviously key to how we think about forensic studies. And then we'll talk about black box studies uh, for most of the second half of the session today, understanding what they're about and understanding their limitations. A couple of slides of review. Uh, this is the, what I call the big picture for statistics. Uh, so we uh, often think about the population as being all of the things we're interested in all of the people in a medical study, all of the shoes in a footwear study. Um, and then we talk about a sample, which is the set of objects that we have data about. Um, and so this will become much more relevant today. Uh, and I have arrows on the top saying probability tells us what happens when you know something about the population and you wanna say something about the sample. Um, and statistics on the bottom tells us what happens when you have a sample and you want to draw some conclusions about the population. Uh, so that's the review of the big picture. 
And the other review is uh, some of the key concepts from the probability session last week. Uh, I think for the most part, was thinking about it a lot this morning, uh, the four two-hour sessions are reasonably independent. So that is, you should be able to understand everything that I say today, even if you did not see session one. Um, but maybe, hopefully, you get a little bit more out of it having seen session one. So um, probability is uh, the language we use to talk about uncertainty. Probabilities are numbers between zero and one. Uh, sometimes expressed as percentages. So we might say the probability of rain tomorrow is 40% is a way of saying the probability is 0.4. And the main finding last time was to think about what we call conditional probability. And this will play a role today. Uh, conditional probability is a way that we say, what's the probability of some event given some other information that we might have? And as an example, a key concept that we focus on in the short course is uh, the distinction between these two quantities. We can talk about what the probability of seeing a certain type of evidence is, given a hypothesis about the crime, or we can try to talk about the probability of the crime of the hypothesis, given the evidence. So we will see a little bit more of that in the today and the weeks to come. And the last comment here is about Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule we saw last time um, is a way of thinking about evidence using the rules of probability. Um, and so enough said, we'll see what comes up as we go. So as I said, today's focus is starts with thinking about where data comes from. And I wanna talk about two key ideas for where data comes from. One is sampling. So the big picture talks about a population and a sample. Where did that sample come from? Uh, that's the statistical topic of sampling, and we'll talk about that. And then the second way we get data is by running an experiment. And of course, the black box studies that have become common in forensics are an example of a, a study or an experiment. But there are lots and lots of examples of experiments, medical experiments to decide whether a new drug works better than an old drug and the like. So these are the two key areas and they're applied to forensics in a lot of ways. We're most interested in analysis of evidence. And so we'll see that some of the tools for sampling and experimentation are relevant there. Um, but we can think about it in a broader way too. Uh, when someone comes to the lab and says, we have a new training program and you wanna know whether your lab should use the new training program, that might also be a place where you would do an experiment to compare the new program to the old program. So here are some for you know, examples um, for how we think about data collection and why we might collect data. Uh, one talks about learning about a population. And so there's an ongoing conversation in the forensic community about building up a shoe database. So we'd have to think about sampling in that context. Uh, when you get a new instrument in the lab, you'll often do a calibration study where you'll take some samples where you know the answer from the old technique and use the new technique. So these are all kind of data collection areas. Uh, one key, uh, mo one motivating example, if you will, uh, I try to motivate by referring to some of the ASTM standards uh, for forensic work. Um, this is a picture from an ASTM standard relating to seized drugs and how they might be uh, sampled and studied. Um, and I, I put it up in part because it doesn't, look exactly like our big picture, but it does look a little bit in, within the box, right? There's some population of interest at the top of the box here, um, a sampling plan, and then a sampling procedure. And so uh, this is how the ASTM standard thinks about drawing a sample. And you'll notice to the right, they talk about uh, statistical and non-statistical approaches to sampling. And so we'll talk about that. My terminology will be a little different than that standard. Here's how they describe statistical and non-statistical sampling. It says, it, it should really read the second point first. It says, in, if an inference about the whole population is to be drawn from a sample, uh, 
then the plan shall be either statistically based or have an appropriate statistical analysis completed. And the first item says, in many cases, you don't need to do a statistical approach. Um, and so let's talk a little bit more about that. The reason why we sample, we sample because we can't generally study the entire population. It might be too costly to get a, a lot of samples, it might be too time consuming. I don't use the term statistical sampling. Uh, most statisticians don't use it. They use the term probability sampling or non-probability or non-random sampling. Probability sampling refers to choosing the samples to work with using probability as a tool. And non-random sample means not using probability. So generally speaking, one could just pick whichever items you're interested in studying. I should repeat here uh, a remark that Anthony made in his introduction, which is uh, we don't have the chat, but we do have the Q&A function. And thus, if you have a question for me, I encourage you to type it into the Q&A session. Uh, when I have points at which I can easily break, um, I will kind of stop and check that and then uh, take a few minutes to answer the questions. Uh, one of the reasons for re reorganizing the class into four two-hour sessions is to create a little bit more free time. So you should definitely ask questions. If you have a question, almost certainly someone else has that question. So let's talk a little bit about sampling. Uh, we'll start by talking about probability-based sampling. And here's some more terminology in how we do this. Uh, the starting point when you want to collect a sample is the sampling frame. That's misspelled. So I'll make a note. The sampling frame is a list of all the items in the population. And probability is then used to choose the sample. The simplest version of a probability sample is known as a simple random sample. And in a simple random sample, every, you know, if you want a sample of size 10 from the population, every sample of size 10 should have the same chance of being chosen. That's the most basic. And for the most part, when I say random sample, that's what you should think is happening. Um, there are instances in which we want to do things different than that. Um, for example, if you want to take a sample of a population of individuals and you take a random sample of 10 people, you might end up with all males in your study and that wouldn't be great. And so you might decide instead to take a random sample of the males and a random sample of the females to make sure that you have five males and five females in your small study population or similarly for age groups or ethnic groups or whatever. And similarly, sometimes when we're collecting data, for example, a political survey, uh, we might want to not randomly sample, but sample from different congressional districts, for example. And so we might make sure we go within each district. A couple of examples. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples. Um, it's quite old, so it's more than 80 years old. You may have heard about it in the distant past. Uh, the Literary Digest was a magazine. Uh, you've heard, probably heard of Reader's Digest. Literary Digest was a predecessor. Um, and they did a political poll leading up to the presidential election of 1936, which was uh, Franklin Roosevelt against Alf Landon. Um, and the Literary Digest had done polls for the previous five, four or five elections and always gotten the right answer. And in the 1936 poll, uh, they reached out to 10 million people, which is quite a lot at the time, and 2.3 million people responded. And the outcome of the poll was that Landon would defeat Roosevelt, and not just defeat Roosevelt, win by an enormous amount. And of course, it went exactly the other way. Roosevelt won and they were off by 20%. That's an amazingly large amount to be off by. So what happened? The way that Literary Digest did their survey is they sent out a survey questionnaire to all of their subscribers and to other lists of the population that they could get, people who owned autos, people who had telephones, which at the time was not everyone. Um, and the groups that 
had phones and autos, remember this is during the Great Depression, are not representative of the population. So that was one problem. And a second problem, these were discovered kind of as post-mortems, uh, was that when you just send out a survey and invite people to send it back, who sends it back? Uh, not a random sample anymore, but people who have strong opinions, in this case, anti-Roosevelt opinions. Uh, one of my favorite aspects of the story is, I'm not sure how many people on the short course have heard of the Gallup organization. They're a, a polling organization. Um, they were really getting their start right around this time. And they uh, had great success here in two ways, both of which I think is cool. One of which is, so they use probability-based sampling techniques, which were in their early days to do their own survey with a much smaller sample and got the right answer that is predicted Roosevelt would win. Uh, I will note that they had a pretty significant error too. I think they were off by about 5% in the vote, uh, but they at least had the right winner. Um, but the second thing, which I absolutely love and which demonstrates the power of probability-based sampling is they not only got the right answer, but they went back and redid the literary digest poll using random sampling from their frame. So as they took a random sample of literary digest sub subscribers, auto owners and telephone users, and got the same wrong answer as the literary digest did with 5,000 people instead of 10 million people. So, uh, you know, a wonderful story in so many ways from my perspective. So we have a question. Uh, Marissa asked, is the sample the unknown that you're comparing to the population? Uh, I appreciate that question. So when we set out to do a survey to collect data, we typically have a question that we want to answer. In this example, the question was, what fraction of people intend to vote for Roosevelt and what fraction of people intend to vote for Landon? So that's the unknown, if you will. Um, we'd like to know that for the whole population, but we realize we're not gonna know that until election day. So we decide to do a, a study, collect a sample, and from that sample, try to estimate or learn this unknown quantity. And so I'm gonna keep that question in mind as we go through different examples of collecting data. We'll identify what the unknown quantity is that we're trying to learn about. The sample is a tool to learn about that unknown quantity by taking a subset of the population that we're interested in. So this is gonna come up uh, much more next week, but the way that we can think about most questions that we ask is there's a population we're interested in, and there is some summary quantity in that population we want to know about. And the sample is a more, I would call it more of a tool to learn about, about the question. Okay, more to come. And please ask for more if you want more on that question. So, that, so the previous slide talks about the Literary Digest survey, which for me at least makes the compelling evidence of why probability sampling is so powerful. So why do we do non-probability-based sampling? Well, sometimes we just have to, right? To do probability-based sampling, you need to have a list of the population that you're interested in, and that can be very hard. Um, and one example is if we wanted to study the undocumented or the unhoused population, we generally speaking don't have a list of those people, and so sampling them is much more difficult. How do we sample when we don't have a population list or when we don't want to do a probability sample? Well, we're all familiar with this. Uh, we often get uh, bombarded with opportunities, uh, what used to be called phone-in surveys. The nightly news would do a telephone survey, call this number if you support abortion rights and this number if you don't, right? Um, these days, you're more likely to get a web survey um, uh, and it's often likely to be spam, but if it's not spam, you often get a web survey which says, you know, tell us how you feel about X, click here. Um, and these are non-probability-based sampling. And so they can be highly problematic. Why? When you throw open the door and say, let me know your opinion, you're not getting a representative sample. And so the reason probability sampling is so powerful is by choosing at random 
you know that you're getting a representative group. If you let people self-select into the sample, you have no idea what kind of people are responding. It's almost always not representative because people who feel strongly about an issue are going to weigh in and people who don't feel strongly may not go to the effort. I gave uh, one example of a failed presidential survey uh, in 36. Uh, another one occurred 20 years later um, in 19, I guess it's not quite 20 years later, um, in 1948, Truman versus Dewey election also ended up having a problem. Uh, why? Uh, again, sampling is part of the problem. There are lots of problems, but part of the problem was sampling. Um, when sampling Truman versus Dewey, uh, probability sampling was still not widespread, and the some of the sampling firms used an approach known as quota sampling. And to do quota sampling, they said they would send their survey people out onto the street and say, "I want you, you know, sample 15 people this lunchtime. Um, you know, there should be at least eight men and at least seven women." or sorry, eight men and seven women, and there should be you know, five people over the age of 60. And so the survey person still had a lot of flexibility in choosing the individuals. And it seems in hindsight uh, that they did not choose representatively, that is, you know, who are you gonna walk up to on the street? Right? And so uh, those surveys had all led to the prediction that Dewey was gonna win, and you may have seen the Chicago newspaper that you know published a headline that Dewey won um, based on early results when in fact Truman went on to win. Uh, another fun piece of this story is that uh, there used to be a, a well, there's a well-known uh, gambler named Jimmy the Greek Snyder. Uh, he's passed away. Um, and I read his autobiography and he tells the story of uh, winning a lot of money by betting on Truman because he didn't do random samples, um, but he did do a little bit more data collection. And he said, this election is 50-50 and you can get 10 to one or 20 to one odds on Dewey. Um, and so he bet on Truman and won a lot of money. So that's another fun part. Uh, oops. So, um, so there's a couple of examples about probability-based sampling and non-probability based sampling. How does this relate to forensic science? Well, this is an example that's actually in the seized drug standard that we looked at a few minutes ago. Uh, suppose we seize a shipment of baggies with each with white powder, and we want to know if um, about whether these bags contain drugs. Well, you can think about two different questions. If the first question is, do any of the bags contain drugs? then you don't necessarily care to do a random sample because as soon as you find some in the bag, then that's enough. And so you might just try a few bags and see if you find drugs. If on the other hand, you wanna know how much drugs are in the suitcase, maybe the, the punishment depends on the volume of drugs, for example, which it usually does. Uh, then you wanna draw a conclusion about what fraction of the suitcase is drugs. And then you probably do need to do probability-based sampling, or then you should do probability-based sampling so that you can estimate that unknown proportion of drugs in the, in the suitcase. I list here a couple of other places that comes up. Uh, you know, when you, if you wanna build a database for shoes, you know, how should you get the, the data for that? Should you go to all manufactured shoes? Should you just take the shoes of people who are arrested? Uh, you know, these are the kinds of questions we ask. Uh, so that's kind of a basic introduction to data collection. Uh, you won't be surprised to learn that in a short course of this length, uh, you're not gonna get everything you need to know about sampling. Uh, you can have entire courses on sampling and in fact, CSAFE does. Uh, so we have a course on sampling and you can be on the lookout for that if you wanna learn more about sampling. There are questions about how to determine how big a sample you should take, uh, what to do about people who don't respond to your survey, um, and how to make surveys to avoid getting biased uh, responses. I mentioned there are two ways to collect data, two reasons to collect data. One is sampling, and the other is for an experiment of some kind. Uh, I will say quickly, those actually work together. 
right? Because if you're going to do an experiment, you need to do it on some people. And how do you get the people? Well, that's a sampling question. So we have, how do we get a representative sample? And now let's assume we have that. Then how do we do a good experiment? So what do we mean by an experiment? Well, we want to learn something about the population. And I give two big motivations for studies. One is you might want to understand how some process works. Um, and this is the example we're going to focus in on today. The black box studies are studies in which we try to learn how examiners do at various forensic tasks. I would say it's probably more common to think about an experiment to compare to approaches. So you might want to compare two training programs. You might want to compare a new drug for blood pressure versus an old drug. Um, and so a lot of the ideas of experimental design really come out of this notion of comparing two approaches. And so I'll talk about that, um, but then we will wind our way back to the black box study. A key distinction in an experiment or in a study is between experiments and observational studies. Experiments involve the researcher or the experimenter doing some intervention or manipulation. So in medical studies, they are almost they, they are often experiments. People sign up for the experiment and they either get the new drug or the old drug. That's decided by the experimenter. So that's an experiment. What's an observational study? Well, sometimes you want to study things that you can't do an intervention on. And so you might, if you want to study the effects of smoking, you're not going to randomly assign some people to smoke and some people not to smoke. So you might do an observational study. This slide lays out how you can think about the distinction in one of the settings I described where you have two training programs and you want to know which one does a better job of producing you know, fingerprint examiners. There are two ways to think about it. One way is to say, let me get a bunch of trainees from program A. Let me get a bunch of trainees from program B. And let me see which ones are better. That would be an observational study because the people chose which program to go to themselves. In an experiment, I would get a bunch of people who agree to become fingerprint examiners. I would tell them which program to go to. I would assign them, and then I would compare them. So that's what we mean by an experiment versus an observational study. Uh, and experiments are really better if they can be done. And uh, sometimes they're referred to as the gold standard for determining cause and effect. So a uh, little bit more about experiments. Let me see what okay. Sorry, just uh... so um, often when we do experiments, the goal is cause and effect. That is, we want to know if the new drug causes improved outcomes for the patients. And here's an example of why that's harder than it may seem if you don't do a randomized experiment. So uh, this is a fairly famous one again. Uh, this is has to do with admissions to college, to graduate school. Um, and it was a study that was done at the University of California, Berkeley in 1973. And when you look at the admissions rate, the males were admitted at a 44% rate, the females at a 35% rate. Um, and so this suggests discrimination. And when people went to take a closer look, they found something interesting, which is uh, if you look program by program, um, so we don't identify which is which here, but program A, 82% of the females were admitted and 62% of the males were admitted. Program B, 68% of the females were admitted, 63% of the males were admitted, and so on across the board. These are six of the biggest programs. One thing you notice if you look at that is, generally speaking, females do at least as well as males. And even in the programs where the males do better, C and E, the gaps are pretty small. So how do you get a big gap overall when you have a small gap in every program? Well, it turns out that that simple analysis, which made sense comparing males to females, um, missed an important factor, which is males and females apply to different programs. And males apply to programs A and B, 
in bigger numbers than females, and females applied to programs C, D, E, and F in bigger numbers. And you can see very clearly that A and B accept more students. So I believe A and B were engineering, and I don't remember what the other one was. And so uh, in this case, this simple observational study uh, was a little bit misleading because it missed an important factor. And so that can happen when you do observational studies. There may be some other factor. Randomized experiments do better for a couple of reasons, and they're laid out in these principles for what makes a good study. So the key principles for a good study are if you have two, a treat, two, two things you want to compare, you should try to always set it up so that you have two things that you're comparing. So if you have an existing drug that works well for lowering blood pressure and you have a new one, you do an experiment by comparing the two rather than just trying the new one. Uh, a famous example of this is right, when polio was a big problem and someone came up with a vaccine, polio is a highly contagious disease. And so there was a proposal for a new vaccine. And one idea for studying the new vaccine was to say, let's give everyone the vaccine this year and then we'll compare polio this year to polio last year to decide if it worked. Uh, but that idea was rejected because Polio varied quite a bit from year to year. And if you got had a good year with the vaccine, you wouldn't know if it was because of the vaccine or not. So a much better study was to compare within the same year, some people getting the vaccine, some people not. Second key design is to use randomness again. Randomness was key to getting a good sample. Randomness is key to doing a good experiment so that when you have to decide who gets the new, new vaccine for polio and who gets the old vaccine, you should flip a coin, basically. If you don't flip a coin, you might miss a factor. You might be giving it to people who look healthier or look less healthy. And again, lots of examples in statistics. They did a study of milk, giving milk to children in school to see if it helped with their educational outcomes. And the teachers were allowed to decide who to give the milk to. You can imagine why that might lead to misleading results. Uh, the other points, make sure the sample size is large enough to draw a conclusion. You can't draw a good conclusion by giving one person the vaccine and seeing whether they get sick or not. Uh, you wanna make the environment as realistic as possible. And the other idea that's important is the idea of blinding. It is helpful if people don't actually know which drug they're getting uh, because people could change their behavior. So these are what are called good experimental design principles. Um, and they're really important. And we'll come back to this when we talk about the PCAST report. And that they weighed in on how to do black box studies and it became somewhat controversial. So here's, uh, those of you who were here last week will remember, periodically we break in, do a little bit of a test yourself. So um, we haven't talked about black box studies. We're gonna talk about them a lot this morning, um, but I wanna start by saying, here's a simple idea for how a black box study might work. We might get 50 volunteer forensic examiners in the community who make packing tape comparisons. And, get, and so they're gonna be our people in the study. We're gonna give each one 10 pairs of questioned and known samples. Um, so they'll get a piece of tape, torn piece of tape from a crime scene, if you will, and then uh, a roll and be asked, did, did the crime scene sample come from this roll? And um, so that's the task. Uh, in a black box study, the researchers know the ground truth for each pair. So they know whether the tape did come from the roll or not. And um, we're gonna ask the examiners to do this. And then the examiners uh, return their data, but some don't complete all 10. So, so here's a quest two questions. Uh, the first asks about using volunteers. Um, what is a potential problem with using volunteers? And the second is, is it a problem that examiners didn't complete all pairs? So in each question, I give you four choices. And we're gonna put up the Zoom poll and ask you to, or hopefully we're gonna put up the Zoom poll um, and ask you to choose the answer you think best for each of those two questions. So the first question asks about a disadvantage of using volunteers. And 
everybody, just about everyone got that right. Um, in fact, I'd say everyone got it right. 36 people said they're not representative. Um, and one person said they're more experienced, which is a way of saying they're not representative. And similarly, uh, for question two, uh, almost everybody got it right. So let's look at those uh, again. Um, this just repeats the question on the top of this slide. Um, as everybody identified, the key disadvantage of using volunteers is that they may not be representative of the population. Um, they could be more experienced, which is what someone guessed. They might be less experienced. The point is they're not randomly representative. Um, I will say, why do we use volunteers? In some ways, it's the only possible way to do the study uh, at the moment, right? People have full-time jobs. Their lab may not allow them to participate. And so randomly picking people to participate may not be effective. Uh, the second part talks about some missing data in this case, if the examiners don't complete everything. Um, that could also be a problem because, again, they may have uh, not answered the hard questions or may they, maybe they didn't answer the easy questions because they didn't want to waste their time. So they just focused in on the more interesting cases. So uh, the, the key part of the first chunk of the course of this session of the course is then, you know, the key role that randomness plays, we need a representative sample. And when we do an experiment, we want to make sure we have a fair comparison. So thank you for participating in that. Uh, second segment of today's uh, discussion is about measurement. Uh, so here's another ASTM standard. Um, it, it, this one's focused on measuring trace elements for glass. And there's not too much to say here. You can read through this and it says, you know, glass, chemical measurements in glass have been proven to be helpful for discrimination. And uh, here's a bunch of elements. So, uh, so we're going to measure glass, and we'll talk a little bit about that in, in today and in the following weeks. Um, a key standard, uh, the ISO standard 1725, says laboratories shall identify the contributions to measurement uncertainty. And so, the key point for this little section of the course is when you measure something, there's some uncertainty involved. One of my favorite examples here, for some reason, all of my examples today are presidential elections, but uh, so this is the presidential election of 2000 when Bush ran against Gore. Some of you may remember that was a very, another very close election, and the state of Florida came into play, and Florida had, in some counties, a very strange way of voting where you had to punch out a hole in the ballot, the Chad uh, of the ballot, and so Florida was very close, and there was uh, recounts. And I remember at the time I worked at Iowa State University and I was talking to some of my peers and some people in the community and they always said, I don't understand why every time they recount the ballots, they get a different answer. And for a statistician, that's the most natural thing in the world. If you do anything twice, um, you're likely to get a different answer. I often tell people, just measure your desk twice or measure the, you know, you, if you're going to carpet your room, you know, measure the square footage of the room twice and you'll get different answers. And um, it's one of the reasons they always say measure, measure twice, cut once, right? To make sure you get the right answer, you want to measure more than once. Um, and so uh, when you measure, there's always some variability. Sometimes we call this noise. And knowing how much is critical. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Stephen Green notes that that's ISO... Uh, 17025, which I think is correct. So I will check that out. Um, one of the nice things about doing these slides over and over again um, is there's always mistakes and it's helpful to have people find them for you. I had someone find one last week. Um, and thank you, Stephen, for finding that one today. When we talk about measurements, there are a lot of different kinds of data. Um, we're going to see all different kinds during the course of the short course. Uh, we distinguish between qualitative data and quantitative data, where quantitative data is numerical and qualitative data is not. Um, and when we think about qualitative data, we can think about having something that's categorical, like blood type, or something that's ordinal or ordered, like grades in a class. And when we think about quantitative data, we can think about something that is discrete, that is, takes a small number of values, or continuous, where we have uh, essentially infinite number of possible values. And we'll talk a little bit about each of these as we go forward. 
Uh, scientists talk about measuring uncertainty usually by saying, oh, this thermo thermometer is accurate to within plus or minus 0.1 degree or something. Uh, statisticians differ a little bit in how they talk about uncertainty. Uh, for one thing, they talk about uncertainty in lots of ways. So measurement uncertainty is one kind of uncertainty, but sampling uncertainty is another kind. And so statisticians talk about uncertainty a lot. Um, one famous quip about statisticians is being a statistician means never having to say you're certain okay, instead of never having to say you're sorry. Um, uh, so the way statisticians tend to talk about uncertainty is, uh, you know, the probability of rain tomorrow is 60 percent. That's a way of describing uncertainty about tomorrow's weather. Uh, saying that the scale provides weights that are normally distributed with a standard deviation of a tenth of a kilogram, which may not mean a lot to you right now, um, but I'll, we'll talk more about it, is another way of describing uncertainty. And the way scientists talk about uncertainty, you know, the measurement is accurate to plus or minus 0.5 with 95% confidence or something like that. So, so that's what we mean by uh, taking measurements and describing their uncertainty. And there are a number of terms that come up, and so I'm going to try to clarify. Uh, there's always a risk in doing so uh, that there'll be confusion, uh, but that's part of the way to get to the understanding is to hear the different terms. So the first term I want to talk about is variability. Uh, variability basically refers to the fact that we will get different answers when we do different measurements, and there are lots of different types of variations, and we'll see some of this in black box studies. You can talk about taking repeated measurements of the same object by the same person. So when I ask you to measure this twice, that would be an example of that. Um, or you could get repeated measurements by having different people measure the object. So a good way of confirming a measurement is to say, I measured this desk and found out that it was 36 inches wide. Can you measure it and see if we get the same answer? Um, and then if you have a company and you produce light bulbs or widgets or rulers or whatever, um, you might now want to talk about how much variability is in their measurements of different objects. So different samples of glass and do that with a single person or with different people. So lots of different kinds of variability. How do we measure variability? Well, when we take measurements, we, we tend to summarize them in two ways. We summarize them with a measure of what is often called a measure of central tendency. What is a typical value? And then we measure how variable the measurements are. So here's an example. It's a little bit of a, what I would call a calibration example. Suppose we're interested in blood alcohol level. Well, as we all know, there's a standard way of doing that by taking a blood sample. Um, but Someone invents a new approach, and they have, which is the breathalyzer, right? And so you want to take a breath-based measurement to estimate the blood alcohol. So when you discover a new method like that, what should you do? Well, you should use the existing method, the blood sample, to get the measurement, and then use the breath-based measure to see if you get the same answer. And so here's a little study. It's actually made up data. We take a sample where the blood alcohol is known to be 0.08 which actually refers to 80 milligrams per every 100 milliliters. And then we take 10 samples using the breath approach and measure the same, the blood alcohol. And I've sorted the observations here. So we got a 69, or which would be a 0 0.069, and we got a 74, 77, uh, a couple of 80s, uh, 89, 120. Uh, so if you have 10 samples like that, you can summarize them by saying the average of those is 83.4. And so the average says uh, the breath works well, but not perfectly. Um, there are other measures though. The median is another measure. To get the median, you put the observations in order and you take the middle. And in this case, the, there are two in the middle and they're both 80. So the median is 80, which happens to be exactly the right answer. Um, the mean is what we use most often. The median has an advantage. This 120 is kind of high and unusual. You wonder maybe it was misreported, for example. The median is not affected by that because it only looks at the middle. The average is affected by everything. So a little bit more about this next week. 
Uh, I you introduce it here so I can talk about what we mean by variability. Variability is how variable are those measurements. And so they range from 69 to 120. Um, there are a number of different measures here. Uh, the standard deviation is the one that we'll spend the most time on during the short course. The standard deviation, as the name seems to suggest, is a, uh, is a measure of a typical deviation. The right answer should be 80. What's a typical deviation? Well, we saw a deviation of 11, 69 was 11 below the right answer. We saw a deviation of 40, 120 was 80, 40 above the right answer. And so the typical deviation in this case using a common formula turns out to be 14. So that's one measure of variability. But people sometimes summarize the variability in a sample in other ways, for example, by giving the range, between 69 and 120, the range is 51, or by giving what's known as the interquartile range, by looking at the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile. Um, unlike the measures of central tendency, where you expect all of the answers to give similar results, for variability, these are measuring three very different things, and so they give you very different answers. Uh, as I said, the standard deviation turns out probably to be the most important measure to know for continuous data. Second concept is reliability. Reliability is actually closely related to variability. Reliability comes up a great deal in forensics. Uh, why does it come up so much? Well, it comes up because reliability is used in, for example, the federal rules of evidence regarding scientific evidence testimony, saying that the evidence the testimony should, the evidence should be reliable. Um, when they say reliable there, um, they're using it in the colloquial sense of trustworthy. Is a person reliable? Are they trustworthy? Uh, today, we want to talk about reliability in a more technical or scientific way. And reliability in a scientific sense means consistent measurements. Do we get the same answer if we measure again, or if we repeat the process. And I struggle a little bit with how to distinguish between variability and reliability. Um, but so here's the example that I tend to use. Um, variability is also related to consistency of measurement. If you always get the same measurement, the standard deviation would be zero, right? So that's our measure of variability. Um, and so variability also measures consistency. Um, but here's an example. If you have a scale with low variability, that is the scale always gives the same answer when you put the same object in, we would consider that scale to be reliable, right? It's giving consistent measurement. But now let's suppose we have a bad scale and the scale is very, appears to be somewhat random. That is, I get on the scale and one morning I'm 165, and I get on the scale the next morning and I'm 170, and I'm concerned about that. So that might me lead me to conclude that the large variability means low reliability. I'm not getting consistent measurements. But one of the things that we will learn again next week is the we can develop a measurement protocol for using this inferior scale. Because it's inferior, I can't rely on a single measurement, but we may discover through research that if you take 20 measurements and average them, you get a reliable answer out. So we would say a single measurement in this case is not reliable, but the average of 20 is reliable. And so, so that's, for me, a little bit about how I think about variability and reliability. Again, closely related concepts. For a measurement to be reliable, we expect to see little variability. And in my scale example, we see a lot of variability in one measurement, but we don't see as much variability when we average 20 measurements. So that's kind of my uh, basic intro to reliability. And uh, Stephen asked, well, if I will explain the difference between reliability and repeatability. And yes, you're kind of perfectly tracking my presentation. So uh, 
Uh, we will get to that shortly. Uh, when we talk about reliability, there are actually a lot of different terms that come into play. Reliability is the, I would say, the overall concept, the general concept. But there are specific types of reliability. And if you will, they're related to some of the different types of variation that I mentioned a few slides ago. There's two that come up most often in forensics are repeatability and reproducibility. And these have come to be mean the following. When we ask whether something is repeatable in a measurement setting, we ask whether the measurement or the decision would be the same if the same item was used in two comparisons with the same examiner. Right? So here I brought in the idea of reliability to be both about measurements and decisions because we're headed to talking about black box studies. So the repeatability question is, if I give you a questioned latent print and a known exemplar, and I ask you, do they come from the same source? Um, and you give me an answer, you either identify them as coming from the same source, you're not in, you're inconclusive, or you exclude them from coming from the same source. The repeatability question is, okay, I'm gonna come back to you in six months and see whether you give me the same answer. So that's the repeatability. It's the same person doing the same thing. Reproducibility is the same piece of evidence, but now a different examiner. Would a second person looking at the print reach the same conclusion you did? Both interesting questions, both important questions, both getting at the reliability of a process. It is typically the case that repeatability is the um, is higher, that is going back to the same person, gets you more reliable measurements or more reliable conclusions than going to a different person. Uh, so sometimes I will use the idea that repeatability is within examiner or intra-examiner, and reproducibility is between examiner or inter-examiner. So uh, we'll talk a lot about this in the remainder of the session today. So here's a reliability example before we get to the black box studies. Um, it's a project that I was involved in. I was working with a handwriting analyst um, who, a document examiner, um, and they were interested in looking at signature complexity. So it's long been believed, and it is true that the more complex a handwriting sample, uh, the more confident an examiner can be in their conclusion. Um, but if you're gonna rely on complexity, it begs the question, how reliably can we, dis can we agree on what's a complex signature or not? And so I was involved in a small study to do that um, with a document examiner. And we got five document examiners and we had 123 signatures. It's actually 123 signers. Um, each signature, each signer agreed to provide five signatures on a sheet of paper. And then those sheets of paper were shared with the examiners. They were asked, uh, how easy would it be to simulate this signature on a five point scale? Um, and some of the data is shown in this table. Uh, signer number one, uh, the document examiner one said it was a four. It would be difficult to simulate. Document examiner two said it was a four, but notice there's some variability. Document examiner three said it would be very difficult. Document examiner four said it would be medium. And you see two things in this little table, one of which is, uh, not surprisingly, there's differences in the rows. So signature five is obviously easier to simulate than signature two. Everyone agrees on that. But the second point that shows up in the table is there's considerable variability across the examiners. That's not a surprise. It's not a bad thing. If you give people a scale, they're going to use it in a different way. What's difficult for me may be very difficult for you. But this is a data set that we collected, and we could use it to talk about reliability, reproducibility. And there's a lot of ways to measure reproducibility. I'm just going to talk here. We, we computed the correlation between the two columns of numbers. So you have 
123 signatures, you have what examiner one said, you have next to it what examiner two said, you can correlate those. Correlation is between negative one and one, high correlations are more reliable. And so here the correlation was 0.65, which is good, um, not great, but good. An interesting piece of this that I can't go into great detail is uh, we did a very small subset of the group where we did the repeatability study. We, after a, a month or two, we sent seven signatures um, back to some of the same people. And so we had five examiners saw seven signatures twice. And for them, we could say, did they give the same exam answer both times? And what was interesting here was the correlation turned out to be 0.68, which is very similar to the 0.65. So in this case, we can, there's some degree of, there's some ability to agree on what's a complex signature, but that two measurements from the same person are no more reliable than two measurements from two different people. So we found that interesting. The final concept when we talk about measurement is validity. Validity is another one of these words that has a colloquial meaning, right? When we talk about something being valid, we mean it's legitimate. And there's a technical meaning about validity as well. In fact, validity is even more complicated than reliability in some ways, because there are many, many ways in which validity is used in science. Um, we're going to use validity today to mean accuracy. A measurement or decision is valid if it matches a known truth. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't have to worry about the rest of the information on this slide, but I put it there because um, you may have in your uh, undergraduate studies or graduate studies seen some of these types of terms, internal validity, external validity, convergent validity, discriminant validity. Um, these all are appropriate terms. As I said, validity has lots of meanings, um, but we're only thinking today about validity as a form of accuracy. important points on validity. Validity is different than reliability, but they have consequences for each other. Uh, so two important points here. The first, high reliability is required to have a valid measurement or procedure. Why? An accurate procedure always gives the right answer, right? If a scale is accurate, it always gives the exact weight of the item that's being measured. If an examiner is accurate, they always give the right answer to the forensic sample. What that means is if they're accurate, they also have to be reliable because they have to give the same answer every time if they're going to give the right answer every time. So that way works. If you're, if you're valid, you must be reliable. The opposite way does not work. High reliability does not guarantee a valid procedure. Why not? Because all that reliability says is, do you give the same answer? Not to give the right answer, but do you give the same answer? So uh, a scale can always give the same reading for a, for, the, for a particular object, but it may not be correct. The scale may be set wrong. Um, I'll, I will always remember one of my first interactions with uh, some forensic examiners as part of the OSAC. Um, there was a meeting in Oklahoma. Some people on the course may have been there. Um, and I was late to the meeting, not good for me. Um, and I showed up at a meeting of footwear examiners the second day of the meeting. And they were a little upset because some of the conversation during the first day had kind of said, um, you know, we need to do studies and we, we need to show that, you know, footwear examiners are, are valid. And there was a lot of hand wringing that that was really hard to do for a variety of reasons. Um, and one of the things I remember pointing out was, even if we can't do that, we can do this first part very simply. That is, we could do the reliability study. We could take some samples where we know the answer, send them around, send images around and see if we all agree. Right. Um, even if we don't know that there's a gold standard, we can see we all agree. And so that's kind of a key point here is reliability. First question, do we all agree? Validity. Second question, are we all right? 
So here's a couple of quiz questions to review what we just saw. This is four different items. Each one is a true false question. So uh, the way that we've got it set up is you should indicate, I think, well, I'm not sure. Let's see how it's set up. But so there are four statements here and you're asked to kind of true or false for each one, or maybe it's say which ones you think are true. Let's see how we frame the Zoom question there. Uh, everyone correctly identifies repeatability and repeatability as being the same, uh, varying degrees of uh, agreement with the other three. Uh, so, so let's go to the next slide and look at these more carefully. First item said re repeatability and reproducibility are both components of reliability. That is true, and most people said it was true. Good for you. Uh, the second item said repeatability uh, refers to within examiner assessments. Um, sorry. The second one said repeatability is a between examiner assessment. That is false. Repeatability, um, and there's good reasons for being confused here. So nobody should feel bad at all. Um, it's just getting used to the language uh, because both repeatable and reproducible sound like a high bar. So it's not obvious which is which, but repeat is intended to be an exact repeat. So that's within the examiner. Reproduce is, can someone else reproduce? Um, and then the third is this important point about the distinction between reliability and validity. Repeatability only guarantees consistency of measurement. It has nothing to do with the answer. And the fourth is the correct way of saying it. If we highly accurate, then we do have to be reliable. We do have to be reproducible. So now in the time that remains, let's take the statistical conversation that we just had about sampling, about data collection, about data measurement, about reliability, and about validity, and apply it to forensic science. And for me, the most natural way to do that is to talk in some depth about black box studies. So I have a few slides uh, that, you know, just move us from the statistics to the forensics. Uh, you all will know this very well, uh, but it's a little bit of a level setting for us. Uh, I, 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 this is, I, I will say these things and have said these things every week. Okay. Uh, the first is that there are a lot of different forensic exams, but given the work that CSAFE does, we will focus on source conclusions here. So periodically I use an example like I did blood alcohol, but by and large, we're talking about same source, different source. There's evidence, typically of a, a crime scene sample and a suspect sample. And um, we're gonna look at those evidence samples and try and decide whether uh, between two hypotheses, S, same source, and uh, not S, different source. Um, and, uh, and then the way that we, so sorry, this applies very broadly. As I said, CCA focuses on pattern evidence. So that's glass, latent prints, shoe prints. Uh, but the same, same source question does apply in other evidence types, DNA evidence, blood type, fibers, and the like. Um, obviously, uh, different analysis techniques for different types of measurements. Uh, again, things we all know, the Daubert standard identifies the judge's gatekeeper. Uh, for today, key thing to know about the Daubert decision is um, it asked the judge to determine whether evidence is reliable, and it suggests using these as standards. Uh, has data about the method been peer reviewed and published? Do we have error rates? Uh, do we have standards and controls, et cetera? Um, and so the PCAST report obviously weighed in and talked a lot about error rates. So that's what we're going to focus in on here. Um, I think about the logic of the forensic exam. And as you all know, I am not a forensic examiner, uh, but this is based on uh, lots of conversations with forensic examiners. Um, and even sitting in on some exams. We examine the evidence, we look for similarities and differences, and then we just try to determine whether, uh, you know, 
the similarities and differences we're seeing are consistent with same source or not. If I'm looking at fingerprints, I see some similarities, some minutiae that agree. I see some differences, maybe due to distortion. I think I can explain them. I, I might draw one conclusion. Um, so, so that's kind of the logic of the forensic exam. And then last segue, a um, lot of ways to carry out a forensic exam. Uh, I, there've been many papers written over the years where people say, oh, here are different types of forensic analyses. Uh, for me, I tend to break the world up into three categories. There are forensic exams at which the analysis and conclusions are based on uh, expert opinion. There are, uh, there's a quantitative approach uh, known as the two-stage approach, uh, where in the first stage, we look and see whether the two samples, crime scene and suspect, are uh, agree or match or are similar or indistinguishable, whatever word you like to use. Um, and then the second stage would say, okay, these seem to match. How unusual is that? Could that be a coincidence? And then the third approach is the likely ratio, which we talked briefly about in week one. Um, and as I mentioned at the start of today's session, um, uh, I'm excited about the course in four pieces because it allows me to break these three apart and teach the relevant statistics, reliability and validity for today, and then talk about how that relates to one of these approaches, expert opinion. Uh, next week, encourage you all to come back. We'll talk about statistical inference and how that relates to the two-stage approach. And then the last week, we'll, we'll kind of put everything together and talk about the likelihood ratio. So for today, we want to talk about forensic conclusion as expert opinion. Uh, we did not ask at the beginning of the class today what everyone does, but you know, when we did it last week, what we saw was uh, Almost everyone listening is a forensic examiner who works in one of the pattern disciplines. So you're familiar with this. The idea is the expert analyzes the evidence based on their experience, their training, and the methods that the field has agreed are appropriate. And then at the end, what you're getting out is the examiner's expert opinion. And that opinion is most often reported as a categorical conclusion. Uh, we will talk about the noblest latent print black box study. Uh, the conclusions there were uh, individualization or identification, one uh, inconclusive or exclusion. Uh, for those involved in the OSAC or following the activity of the OSAC, uh, there's currently a lot of conversation about moving towards scales that might have more than three categories. For example, some support, strong support, very strong support, et cetera. Um, and I note here that um, has been and still is some discussion about what kind of expert opinion statements ought to be allowed, uh, whether you know identification should be allowed or not. I give one such example here. Uh, before we dive too deeply into black box studies, I want to refer to a point we discussed last week and we'll discuss again in the weeks to come. Uh, I'm going to pick on handwriting examiners here. Uh, they have a nine point scale in which uh, they make statements like, based on the evidence, the author of the known samples wrote the question sample. That's the most extreme positive statement or affirmative statement. Um, they might say the author of the known sample, it is highly probable that the author of the known samples wrote the question sample probably wrote the question sample, uh, indications, et cetera. And then they have a similar on the negative side, definitely did not write the question sample and so on and so forth. Um, I wanna say two things about this. Uh, I don't wanna be perceived as picking on handwriting examiners. Um, the two things I wanna say, the first is a negative, which is these are statements that sound like they are talking about the hypothesis. So to me, they read about, when I say highly probable that the author of the known samples wrote the question sample, I'm making a probability statement about the hypothesis that these two samples have the same author. We saw last week in the case of Skipper, uh, Connecticut versus Skipper, that that can be problematic because the only way to make a statement about the hypothesis 
based on the evidence, is to start with a prior opinion about the the hypothesis. And the judge in the skipper said, said, well, wait, that that goes against the notion of innocent until proven guilty, right? That is, if you start by saying I'm I have fifty percent chance that the author is this, the, the author of the known is the same as the author of the sample, um, you know, that seems inappropriate. And that's the only way to make statements like this. So that's the bad side about this scale. I do want to turn around, though, and note that uh, if you go back and read the basis for this scale, the folks who wrote the scale were not trying to do that. That is, they chose language that, at least to a statistician, suggests the probability of a hypothesis. But the definition of what it means to say, based on the evidence, the author of the known samples wrote the question sample, is really, uh, they did really ha have a probability interpretation, which was based on what I see in the evidence, the features that I see agreeing, uh, that would be exactly what I would expect to see if they matched, if it was the same author. And uh, I, I don't see any things that I would expect to see if they were different authors, right? So they were really talking about the probability assigned to features based on the hypotheses, which is what I'm going to argue we should do. Uh, but then they chose to summarize it in a way that suggested the opposite. Uh, hopefully not too confusing, but uh, that's one we talked about last week, talked about today, and we'll talk about again in week four. So we'll get another crack at that one. So when we do forensic conclusions as expert opinion, uh, we might want to ask, as per Federal Rules of Evidence 702, what does it take for us to believe that the testimony is based on sufficient facts or data that is the product of reliable principles and methods? Well, we can go back to the reliability and validity discussion that we had 15 minutes ago or 20 minutes ago. We, would, we could ask, would the same analyst draw the same conclusion if they looked at the evidence anew? The repeatability question. We could ask, would different analysts draw the same conclusion given the same evidence, what we call reproducibility. We can ask, do analysts get the right answer for examples where we know the right answer? So these questions of repeatability, reproducibility, and validity, to me, directly address what FRE 702 says we should be looking at. And it is, in fact, the approach that, the conclusion that PCAST also drew when they were asked to look at the practice in pattern comparison discipline. So let's talk about PCAS briefly. And what did PCAS say? This is all kind of new for me. In previous incarnations of the class, I made passing references to PCAS, but I wanted to dive a little deeper today as we think about black box studies. PCAS basically said, we should ask that fields demonstrate validity and they, did it in a couple of different ways. Uh, one of the things I do not like about PCAST is they just made up their own world. They made up this notion of foundational validity, um, which is not necessarily well known in the field. So I didn't really appreciate that. But their main point was that we should do studies of performance to assess reliability and validity. And these are called black box studies because the examiner is treated as a black box that produces conclusions. A black box is a concept that comes up in lots of domains where you think about uh, a decision-making process or some other process as anything that has inputs and then outputs can be viewed as a black box. Uh, I have a colleague who says, you know, one way to think about the university is we have inputs students and outputs graduates. And it's fair to ask, you know, do the graduates come out better than the inputs in ways that we might care about? Are they more employable? Are they better citizens? Are they better educated citizens, right? So that would be a black box view of the university. A black box view of forensics is I can give you a question and a known, and you can give me out an answer. I'm not asking you how you do it. I'm not telling you how to do it. I just want to know how you perform. 
That's what we mean by a black box study. PCAS has a section in which it said, forensic disciplines should do studies like these to establish the validity of the overall field. And they put said, identified a number of conditions. Um, the study should include a large number of examiners and examinations. The examiners should be representative of the population. We should use samples with known ground truth. The samples should be representative of the kinds of samples seen in casework. The study should be overseen by an independent party. The study should be peer reviewed and the results should be shared widely. Um, and you need more than one study. Um, I wanna draw your conclusion to these. I'm not gonna flip back, um, but you have the slides. I hope you're supposed to have the slides. Um, if, you can, if you go back after the session today, and talk about the session where I said, what does it take to do a good experiment? You'll see remarkable overlap. Large sample, representative sample, so, uh, as realistic as possible. PCAST wasn't doing anything nutso here. PCAST was just saying, these are the principles of good experimentation. Uh, of course, the PCAST report is controversial. Um, and uh, the DOJ, the Department of Justice, issued a statement in January of 2021 arguing that black box studies recommended by PCAST are, are not really required. That is not required by science. Um, lots of scientists objected to the DOJ statement, DOJ statement um, but they argued, um, not quite sure how to say this, but right, there was a, an argument made basically that there are lots of examples where people do studies and don't do all of these things. Therefore, we don't have to do those kinds of black box studies. We can establish reliability and validity in other ways. So uh, I always like to say, you know, the single statement of the DOJ statement that I agree with is it is absolutely true that you don't have to do everything that PCAST suggested. We've already seen that there's a reason why you might use volunteers instead of a representative sample. But it does not mean that the things PCAST said were wrong. Everything that PCAST said was reasonable. Those are good things to do. And the more of those things we can do, the more convincing the study is. So if it's not been obvious before this point, I will say um, I don't stand behind everything in the PCAST report, but I am a very big fan of the PCAST black box study. Uh, another thing the DOJ statement pointed out, which is true and accurate, is my right, black box studies are about a discipline. They don't apply in any single case. So we'll come back to that. So let's talk about black box studies. Um, one of the first to be published, uh, certainly post National Academies report, was the Noblest FBI Latent Print Black Box Study, uh, published uh, initially in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, a, a very highly regarded journal. Uh, the study had 169 examiners participate, 744 pairs of latent and known uh, prints were prepared. Um, as, as, as we say, to do a black box study, the examiners, the, the people who did the study know the truth, the examiners don't know the truth. Um, they selected pairs and sent them to the examiners. Each examiner assessed about 100 pairs. So let's talk first about the accuracy or validity part of the study. Um, so here's a table that shows the results from that paper. There were all told 5,969 comparisons in which the truth, the ground truth was these were mated pairs. The latent came from the same finger as the known. And in those comparisons, there were the examiners reached 450 exclusions, 1,850 inconclusives, and 3,600 individualizations. And in the non-mated pairs, there were 4,083 non-mated pairs, and you can see the outcomes. And so we can now look at this performance and talk about accuracy. The mated pairs should have been individualized. The false negative rate or false exclusion rate was 450 out of 5,969 was 7.5%. The false positive rate or the false ID rate was six out of 4,083. 
which is 0.15%. So these were the findings. Uh, as I say, I absolutely enjoyed this paper. It, it's really valuable data. In fact, I would argue um, it was valuable to the discipline in two ways. One of which is, um, you know, there was this history of fingerprint examiners testifying that the error rate of our process is zero. Um, that was never a believable statement. There is no process that has zero error rate, you know, and fingerprint examiners, and there was court testimony where they would say, you know, mistakes happen, but that's because the examiner doesn't do the process right. If the examiner did the process right, there'd never be a mistake. You know, as I say, I don't, most scientists don't find that credible. And so here we have an actual assessment of false identifications that supports what examiners have been saying. That it's very rare that an exam uh, an ID is wrong. It's not zero, but it's very rare. It's one between one and twice per thousand cases. That's good to know. Um, but I think it also served the field in that the false negative rate was surprisingly high. I think um, examiners uh, in a survey that accompanied the study acknowledged that false exclusions happened. Um, you know, but everyone was confident they never had. And where, uh, where, whereas it's true that only a small number of examiners made false positives, I think it was 85% of the examiners had a false negative or false exclusion. One thing to note here that I will come back to is that the inconclusives are being essentially treated as correct, or at least as non-errors here. When I say six, out of 4,083 4, individualizations were made and the error rate is 0.15%, that's including the inconclusives as non-errors. And this has become somewhat of a hot topic in firearms and I'll come back to it in that context. Um, if you decided to ignore the inconclusives and just say, when latent print examiners make a decision, what's their error rate? You would get on the false, identifications, six out of 3,628, which would be 0.16%. So it wouldn't change very much. But if you did it for, you notice there are a lot more inconclusives among the mated pairs. And if you left them out, you'd actually find out that the false exclusion rate is even higher among decisions. So 10% or 11% of decisions are wrong. Um, so we'll come back to that issue. Um, but I've been thinking about this a lot as I read the slides for this session. And uh, I think the inconclusives didn't get as much attention in this study in part because they were primarily on the mated pairs. More to come on this. Uh, an important yet confusing point. So I would call this, this one optional. I'm gonna describe it. I hope you get it. If you don't, don't sweat it. The most important thing to know is what we just talked about for the false positive rate. But I wanna mention a couple of other concepts and they will bring us back to last week's probability session. Um, the false positive rate or the false ID rate. Uh, I like false ID rate better because it's not necessarily positive to make an ID. It depends on who you are. If you're the person who's a suspect, it's not positive. If you're the police, it might be positive, but it's either way, it's a false ID. The false ID is, the probability that an examiner makes an identification when the true state of the world is their non-mating pair. Easy peasy, good. Uh, there's another concept that comes up when people look at diagnostic tests. And you can think about the forensic examiner as a diagnostician. Their job is to look at the case and make a decision. And for a diagnostician, just like a doctor, you want to know if they're a good diagnostician. When a doctor says, I have COVID, I want to make sure that they're correct. So in, for diagnostics, a quantity that we sometimes look at is the positive predictive value. It is the probability that a pairs are really mates if the examiner says they are. Remember week one of the course, when we say a conditional probability, there are two parts to it. What are we saying? What are we, what are we describing the probability of? What is the random thing we're wondering about? And what are we assuming is true? 
we are in a false positive rate or a false ID rate. The thing that's random is did the examiner make the ID or not? And the, we know the ground truth. For the PPV, we flip it. We're now looking at cases not by ground truth, but by what the examiner said and assessing their performance in those cases. And so you'll notice that one minus the PPV is another quantity that could be interesting. It is known as the false discovery rate. And it's the probability that I'm looking at non-mated pairs given the examiner makes an identification. So now you have here, I wish I could highlight them. Um, and um, do, we have, do we have those kinds of tools? We do. Watch out folks, I've never done this before. Okay. Let's draw your attention to this piece, not very neatly, and this piece. It's one of our classic examples. One is the flip of the other. The top one is, I know the ground truth. They're not mated. And the examiner made a mistake. They said they were. In the bottom, the examiner made an identification. And I asked, how often of those times did the examiner get it wrong and report non-mate? We're talking about two different populations of decisions. One population of decision says, let's consider all non-mated pairs and try to learn the unknown quantity, going back to the first question I was asked today, the unknown quantity for the first one up here, for this one is, what fraction of the time will the examiner make an ident? in this population of non-mated pair. The second also errors is looking at the population of identifications made by examiner A and saying, what proportion of those were wrong? Oh, this stuff kills me. It sounds so similar, doesn't it? It sounds so similar. So the point to emphasize here, the false positive rate is the traditional error rate. That's the one we really want to know about, the top. The false discovery rate is useful, but it's less useful for us. Why is it less useful for us? It depends on the cases I show the person. Here's an extreme example. Suppose I want to test examiners to make sure they can do the job. So I keep giving them sets of mated pairs to make sure they can do it. And examiner number one always reports ID. What does that mean? It means every time this examiner said ID in that study, they got it right. They never made an error. But it does not mean that they would never make an error if they got a non-mated pair. I just don't know that because I didn't give them any. So that's an extreme version, but in general terms, the false discovery rate depends on the mix of cases that you show people. And so you can move it around, whereas the false identification rate is a elemental basic property of a population that you can know about the non-mates. Uh, as I said, you can think about this slide. Let's see if this works, clear all my drawings, beautiful. Well, that was fun. Um, uh, so again, please don't worry if that was not super clear. Um, the key point for us is the false identification rate is when an individualization or identification is made for a pair that is known to be non-mated. So here's another black box study, the Baldwin et al. cartridge case study. Table looks very similar to the table I showed you for the uh, Ulrich et al. Uh, latent print study. In this case, uh, false negative rate actually lower, false positive rate a little bit higher, but not you know not too bad. Twenty two individualizations out of essentially twenty two hundred non mated pairs, so one percent error rate. Inconclusives have become a very big issue here. Why? 
Um, because in my opinion, why, I want to say this carefully, um, inconclusives are always an issue. There's a question about how to think about inconclusives. Uh, as I noted, this first calculation treats the inconclusives as correct. And in this case, I, one worries because the false ID rate is so important that treating inconclusive as correct might not be quite the right approach, uh, especially given that more than a third of the non-mated pairs led to inconclusives. So one thing you can do is look at the false positive rate only looking at decisions. So ignore the inconclusives. That gives you 22 out of 1443. So it goes from 1% to 1.5%. Uh, I've sometimes argued maybe what we should be doing is looking at the two quantities and saying among non-mated pairs, there are a lot of inconclusives. When they do make a decision, the error rate is low, not as low as latent prints, but low. But there are a lot of non decisions in this case. Uh, there are some people, including friends of mine, uh, that are arguing that inconclusives are errors because we know there's a correct answer in this study. Um, and therefore, if you say there are errors, that would make the error rate 34%. Um, I would say I don't find that particularly convincing. That is, if you tell people you're testing that they can give you the answer inconclusive, it's not exactly fair to turn around and say, oh no, now that's a wrong answer. If you didn't want them to say inconclusive, you should have told them, of, you should have used what's known as a forced choice, uh, made them give a decision. So uh, there are some very interesting articles about this. There are people arguing some inconclusives might be the correct answer. That is, the non-mated pair may be similar enough that it should have been determined inconclusive where others maybe are errors. And so, um, you know, again, articles about whether we should determine what the consensus is. And if the consensus is inconclusive, inconclusive becomes the right answer. Um, I raised the issue today. I won't solve the issue today. Um, it's uh, coming up as a huge issue these days in the firearms world. There's been a lot of uh, articles written, a lot of uh, ongoing uh, Daubert hearings in which the inconclusives are, are playing a, a large role. And uh, if we have time at the end, uh, we could talk more about that. Okay, so that was all about validity. Uh, let's use the last 15 minutes to talk about reliability. And so I'm going back to the black box latent print study. Uh, a second paper published a year later looked at repeatability and, rely and reproducibility. These are the reprodu repeatability data. So what's going on here? Again, things broken down by mated pairs and non-mated pairs. And I have, let's just focus on the uh, mated pairs. When the first decision was in identification or an in individualization, the, they would go back to the same examiner seven months later and ask them for their conclusion. You can see repeatability was quite high. 89% of them also individualized it, it the second time they saw it. Interestingly, 3% individualized the first time, it excluded the second time. Important to understand this level of variability, I think. Again, inconclusives repeated very often. I think most people would say 90% is high. But again, it could be humbling for experts who think, oh, I can do this every time, I'll give you the same answer. That's not true, right? 90% is good, but it's important to recognize the variability. Uh, in this case, the exclusions are the ones that are a little bit more interesting. It's a smaller number, so there's more variability in the answer. Um, but a lot of exclusions changed um, the second time around. For the non-mated pairs, again, the exclusions, highly reliable. They were the second highly re re reliable in the sense of being repeatable. The same examiner made the, in the exclusion decision 91% of the time and inconclusive also uh, repeatable. Uh, some people got it, quote unquote, right the second time they excluded. Um, so the repeatability is quite good here. Uh, 
non-mated pairs, small numbers, so we don't draw too much. Uh, individualized pairs, uh, we don't draw too much conclusion because there are only three of them where we had a repeated measurement. Um, and they're non-mated, and so it was good. None of the false IDs were repeated. So the repeatability data from my perspective looks pretty good on the one hand, uh, but uh, it's for some practitioners, I think they're even still a little surprised that it's not 100%. So that's one point. We can go on and look at their reproducibility data. Reproducibility is a different examiner. And so we can have exact same thing here. Uh, there are a lot more totals here. Why? Because when you do a reproducibility study, you can you have two examiners who looked at the same pair and made a decision. Um, things at, things actually end up getting double counted here, and I didn't fix that, but that's okay, uh, right? Because you know, uh, examiner one was the first examiner, and then examiner two was the second examiner. I could look at those same results and say examiner two is the first examiner, and now examiner one is the first examiner, right? Because these were all done um, at just based on the first analyses. But the results still work pretty well. That is, you can look at the mated pairs. So these should have been individualized. And you can see that individualized decisions were reproduced by different examiners at a very high rate, 80%. 16% uh, turned around and said it was inconclusive. It was inconclusive. Uh, inconclusives also reproduced pretty well. And once again, the exclusions, in a way that's that's good, are not reproduced as often. They're the wrong conclusion, right? These are mated pairs, and so only 17% of those were repeated, and uh, we did much better second time around. Uh, Non-mated pairs, again, uh, exclusions, highly reproducible, inconclusions, inconclusives, not quite as repeatable, but not too problematic in that the people who changed their inconclusive or the people who didn't agree about inconclusive reached the right decision on uh, exclusion. In these data, in repeatability, there was never a non-mated pair that was um, individualized the first time, and then the person made the same mistake a second time. Um, that remains true here. Right? That is, um, there were never repeats. So that argues well for latent print examiners. Uh, if the verification step is done well in a lab, um, false identifications ought to be caught at that point. Uh, among the non-mated pairs, there were some individualizations that occurred. You know, someone got it, the first person got it right, and the second person got it wrong, but no instance in which both were wrong. So this is how some of the ideas we've talked about today of doing a study, looking at reliability, looking at reproducibility and repeatability, looking at validity, uh, play out in the black box world. A few final comments for today. Uh, reproducibility, reliability and validity, repeatability should also be listed there. Remember, reproducibility and repeatability are types of validity, are types of reliability. We may think you know, one of the arguments that people make about black box studies is um, helpful to see what the, how the field does, but doesn't tell me what to do in a case, right? Because the, it might depend on whether they are high quality prints or low quality prints, or as we discussed earlier today, might depend on the complexity of signatures. So one thing you could do is do more studies, right? Let's do a study on high quality prints. Let's do a study on low quality prints. Um, and so this that was actually done for handwriting. And so here's a reference and a citation. You can see that our intuition is correct. Performance depends on whether handwriting samples were highly complex or medium complexity. Interestingly, the error rate didn't vary, but the decisiveness of the examiners varied. They did, they were more decisive with high complexity signatures. Uh, a few final remarks about forensic conclusion as expert opinion. Uh, 
information on reliability and accuracy is extremely helpful and will be expected. Black box studies are helpful, my personal opinion. Uh, they have limitations. They may not represent practice. Uh, people know they're being studied. You know, that's one argument that people make. It's also true that when we do this, we don't allow the examiners a validation step. And uh, a big concern that everyone has is they speak to the field rather than to a specific case. And as per the federal rules of evidence, in addition to knowing that the evidence type is reliable, you need to make sure that it was uh, validly applied in the case. And there's a one example that I've seen is a case in North Carolina that was brought to my attention in which Leighton Prince, which we know have really pretty solid scientific foundation, um, were disallowed in a case where the examiner was not able to clearly describe what they had done, was not able to describe the process well. Um, last comment from me, and then we have a couple of quiz questions. Um, always situations where we won't have a black box study, right? It would not make sense for someone to do a typewriter black box study now. There's not that much typewriting happening. To my mind, that's okay. But without the black box study, you can't be certain, right? There's no backup that says human beings can do this task. Uh, there's a study that uh, an acquaintance of mine did uh, that looked at trash bags and said, you know, I can draw a conclusion about whether these two trash bags were consecutively manufactured. Could they? Maybe. It's hard to know, though, whether people could do that and what their error rate would be while doing that. So we just need to be careful what we testify to. As I said, I'm going to close with a couple of test yourselves. So uh, which of these statements are true regarding black box studies? Uh, whether they're valid or reliable. So uh, let's put that one up. People believe question one and three are true. They don't believe that two and four are true, although four was a little confusing. Um, and only 21 people participated. Ooh, we want people to participate. Uh, let's review these quickly. Um, if a black box study finds high validity, then it must also be reliable. Uh, you said true, it is true. Um, remember the argument would be, if it's valid, then the examiners are giving correct answers. If they're giving correct answers, they must agree because there's only one correct answer. So they must be reliable. The second is if a black box study finds high reliability, then it must also show high validity. And of course, that's the version that's false. We could have all the examiners agree, uh, but be wrong. We certainly hope that's not the case, but in terms of conceptual, that's important to understand. Uh, the third says a false identification occurs when a known set of non-matching items are mistakenly identified as coming from the same source. And that is true. This is the definition. Focus on the subpopulation of non-matching items and see if we make mistakes there. That's an important one to lock in on. And the last one is the confusing one, which says you can look at the events made by a, an examiner and report for that examiner how often they get it right. You can do that, but that's not what we would call the false identification rate. That ought to be called the false discovery rate, but it is confusing for sure. So I don't wanna spend more time on it given that we're running out of time today. Um, I do wanna invite, if you have a question, uh, to put it into the Q&A. We'll have a couple of minutes at the end for those. Um, and before I do that, I'm going to ask you your opinion about inconclusive. So here's another quiz. Strongly encourage you to participate. Um, this is a place where there is not a factually correct answer, although there may be factually incorrect answers. Um, it says, which of these are things we should do for inconclusives? And there are five choices. Uh, you can, and as I said, these are kind of opinion questions. So let's see what you thought. Um, uh, so the participation is up. So thank you for that. I do appreciate it. Um, and people like the fourth and the fifth option. Uh, as I say, I did not actually intend for it to be a one choice only. So um, the first one is inconclusive or always errors because the pair must be same source or different source. Um, that is a true statement in some ways, but uh, that does not appeal to me for reasons that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, 
you know, if you're going to let people say inconclusive, um, then, you know, you, you, you have to make those rules clear up front. Um, uh, the statisticians who support it make the analogy of multiple choice exams, right? So uh, if a student doesn't answer the question, you know, we tend to count that as wrong. We don't tend to, you know, ignore it. But, you know, that's a different setting where students are told to answer every question. And if they don't, they know they're getting it wrong. So, so that's, I don't agree with that strong view. Um, inconclusive should always be marked as correct because they're not errors. Uh, that's what was traditionally done in some of these disciplines. And that's, that's clearly not right in my view. Um, uh, inconclusive should be admitted from the error rate calculation. Uh, to me, that's a thing you could do. You could say among the decisions, what was the error rate? Uh, the fourth is what I kind of said in, earlier in the presentation. Uh, I think it's good to have two summaries. Um, both for the field, you can say this is the inconclusive rate and this is the correct rate of decisions. Um, one of the things I like about some of the papers that the Noblest group has done is they tend to report results for the individual examiners in this way by saying, for this examiner, how often did they get inconclusive and how accurate were they when they decided? Those are two different traits of an examiner, right? How decisive are they and how accurate are they when they decide? I think that's a nice way to go. Um, and then the last says a well-designed study should include some cases for which expert would be consensus would be inconclusive. So I think that's a good idea, although it's not so clear how to do that. Um, it's 9.59. I'm going to run over just by a minute or so. Uh, first, to show you a short recap, uh, random samples allow for generalization to the population. Controlled experiments are best. So that's why black box studies are about pow powerful. Um, understanding uncertainty is critical. We talked about what reliability and validity mean. And then we talked about black box studies. And again, I think they're extremely helpful in understanding discipline-wide error rates. And though they're hard to do, there have been a lot of, in my opinion, well done recent studies. And I draw your attention to recently published handwriting, blood stain pattern, and footwear studies uh, out of the noblest group. So please read them if you haven't. I think it's really neat stuff. Um, Lots of ongoing questions, um, so more to talk about. Uh, there is a question. Oh, great question. Anonymous attendee says, can, should proficiency test results be used to find error rates? Why or why not? Um, that's a really good question. Um, in fact, I should add something about that to the presentation, so let me make a note about that. Um, the challenge with proficiency tests is they, as currently practiced, have multiple uses, right? One of which is kind of as a basic, are you good enough to do this? Um, and that's really their main use. I think it would be great if we had proficiency tests that achieved both aims. That is, there would be some set of examples that we might agree are, you should be able to do these. And so you don't get certified if you don't do those, but we should include some harder ones too, so we can get an idea. Because uh, so many people take proficiency tests, we could get an idea about the error rate. But the challenge is, right, if you mix two different purposes in the same test, you know, there's confusion and, uh, and the like. So uh, great question. Apologies that I don't have more time. We lost kind of 10 minutes up front today on our error. So I apologize for that. Um, I, I want to thank you. Um, I'm going to warn Kristen. Kristen's going to queue up a close, which has a few final remarks. Um, I thank you for your attention today. Uh, as I said last time, please tell your friends. We welcome them for parts three and four. Uh, there's some overlap, but I think they're pretty helpful on a individual session basis. Uh, so thank you. Have a great day or a great evening, depending on where you are. Hal, thank you again for joining us this week and for sharing your wisdom and answering questions as you go. Uh, it's always really valuable uh, to be able to provide that immediate feedback, and we appreciate okay. that. Thank you all for joining us. We hope you have a great day. Bye.